You need to enable the screen sharing also, please. Okay, a very good morning uh, to all of you and welcome to this session, uh, which is titled as uh, Investing in Inclusive Agri-Food Systems Transformation. This is part of the FAO's track during the World Investment Forum. Uh, my name is Ahmad Mukhtar. I'm Senior Economist at the FAO Regional Office for Near East and North Africa. And for this session, we have uh, an excellent set of panelists. Uh, three, four of them are joining online, and then we have three offline. We have our uh, Chief Economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, Mr. Maximo Torero. Uh, from the FAO, we also have uh, Mr. Benjamin Davis, who is the Director of the um, uh, Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division. Um, then online, we have Mr. Adib Qasim, who is the Director of uh, Economic Development Initiatives, HSA Yemen. Madam Shada Sharif, she is Senior Advisor for the Green Economy Investment and Finance and um, founder of Sustain MENA. Now, with us uh, in presence, we have uh, Madam Nadine Gabosa. She is Director for Food Systems at EFAT, International Fund for Agriculture Development. Um, we have Mr. Fawad Bajwa, who is the co-founder for the Digital Data Climate Smart Villages Network. And we have Mr. Nicholas Farhat, um, who is director at the Barry Tech and the regional manager for MENA for the water and energy for food. We apologize for delay, which was due to the sound system checking and all of that. Um, so we will start and we would have actually um, uh, keynote uh, addresses from the FAO side in order to put things in context. And then we would move to the... Uh, participants with some of the questions. So in order to start uh, the proceedings, first, uh, if I could request uh, Mr. Maximo Terrero, who is the Chief Economist of the FAO, to give his uh, introductory or let's say the keynote strategic uh, points for this one in order to highlight what FAO is doing and where do we invest or where do we need to invest in order to have the inclusive uh, agri-food systems transformation because in FAO we say that we need to transform the agri-food systems in order to make these efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. So inclusiveness is quite at the core. And most of the times that we heard during this forum, when we talk about the financing or investments, we take oftentimes a transactional approach or a commercial approach. At FAO, and I'm sure with IFAD and other partners as well, the Rome-based agencies, as we say, we focus quite a lot on the inclusive angle of this one, and certainly many of the development partners would share that. So in order to start, um, may I request uh, Mr. Maximo Torero to, to give his address via Zoom, and then we'll move on to, the, um, to Mr. Benjamin Davis. So Maximo, thank you, you can thank, kindly... Thank you so much. Start. I hope you can hear me well, uh, and I hope you can see my, my slides. Is that the case? Yes, we can see that. Perfect. Okay, so thank you so much for the kind invitation. Uh, what I am going to do is to present the framework and the logic in which we are working in terms of investing in agri-food system transformation uh, in the world and trying to see how we can accelerate the process. So first, we need to understand agri-food systems, where we are and where we need to be. That, I think, gives you an idea of what are the gaps and where investments are, are required to achieve these gaps. And most of this comes from the information that we report every year with the State of Food and Agriculture uh, and nutrition in the world, uh, which is the SOFI, what we call the SOFI. Now, there are overarching drivers that are affecting our agri-food systems. We have population dynamics and urbanization. The SOFI of this year had a deep focus on urbanization and showed that ur urbanization is a continuum that goes from rural to urban. And in that continuum, rural people are also consuming processed goods. And therefore, we cannot assume that rural people are only consuming what they produce because that will affect their access to healthy diets. There is economic growth, structural transformation and macroeconomic stability, which in the last three years has been extremely complex and it has been choked by significant amounts of problems of debts and, and, and many countries being in debt stress, especially in Africa, and also has shown the importance of cross interdependencies across countries. But big data generation control and use of ownership is also an important driver that we need to look at carefully. The way data is evolving and the way the data is being generated and concentrated will also create some dynamics that could be complex. Geopolitical instability and increasing impacts and conflicts, we are observing this more than ever in the last years since, since what we observed in the war in Ukraine, what we are observing today in Israel and Palestine, and all the conflicts that are happening in the African region 
uh, is telling us how how unstable we could be in terms of geopolitical issues and how we need to to worry more on increasing the stability through assuring food security and of course uncertainties which are there and which will continue to be there and for which we need to find ways in which we can increase resilience and increasing resilience means not only being preventive but also increasing capacity of absorption at the country level the world food insecurity indicators are not good clearly uh, although we have stabilized in 2022 relative to 2021 in an average of 735 million people in chronic undernourishment, this has been 122 million more people since 2019. Not only that, the stability of hunger has significantly increased in some regions and subregions. The bigger increases have been in Africa uh, and, and, and the Caribbean islands, and the improvements have been in Latin America and in Asia. That's why we stabilize, but we are not yet declining as we need to be, unless at the velocity that we need to be. The pandemic has been the major cause of the step back that we have faced, and we have today 2.4 billion people that don't, that in the world that lack regular access to adequate diets, and 3.1 billion people that don't have access to the minimum cost healthy diet. In all the nutrition targets, we are not on track, and we need to accelerate that process. This is just to show the evolution of the numbers. As I was saying, today we are in 735 million people in the middle point because there are some uncertainties and we are still not recovered from the COVID-19, which was a bigger acceleration of chronic undernourishment. But the important thing is when we look at the projections to 2030, this graph shows the projection, which is the red line to 2030, which if we continue as we are today, we will be in 590 million people in chronic undernourishment by 2030. But at the same time, if we take out the effects of COVID-19 and the effects of the war in Ukraine, we will have been in 471 million people. That's the blue dotted line in the bottom. What that tells us is that the agri-food system has tried to respond and, and to cope with the shocks. And if these uncertainties, because nobody expected these two shocks could would not have happened, the situation will be significantly better, around 119 million people less in chronic and by 2030. This opens an opportunity because it means that now if we don't have those type of shocks, we could go back to that pathway, and then we can accelerate that pathway and see what we can achieve by 2030. But again, it's important to note uh, what could have happened without these two uncertainties, which nobody expected. Now, what is needed? First, we need, uh, in the agri-food system, is not delivering what is needed because we have unsafe food. In Africa, one in 10 people uh, are with unsafe food. There is significant food loss and waste, 14% of losses, 17% of waste. There is environmental destruction affecting the land, water, sea, and atmosphere. Poverty is bigger than 80% and extreme, of extreme poor people living in rural areas and working in agriculture. And inequality has increased substantially since COVID-19. Where we need to be is our target, and that's where we need to look at our investments. We need to reduce undernourishment to be everywhere to a maximum of 5%. That's the target of the 23rd. Zero hunger, which in our numbers is 5%. Healthy diets have to be affordable for all. Overweight reduced everywhere to levels of 15%, similar to what it was in 1980s. Because today, today overweight, overweight and obesity has accelerated enormously, even surpassed chronic undernourishment. So it's not only an issue of undernutrition, it's also an issue of overnutrition and the consequences it has on, 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 on NCDs, non-communicable diseases. Obesity needs to be reduced to no more than 5% in any country. So those are the targets. But we also need to focus on nutrition, and standing among children needs to decrease significantly. We should recover also the lost decade of rural poverty, and inequalities needs to be reduced significantly, substantially. And for the planet, we need to achieve land degradation neutrality, increase the efficiency in the use of water for agriculture, reaching the Paris Agreement target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions so that we can achieve the 1.5 degrees and the 2.5 degrees Celsius, so that we don't get into this black box, because once we cross Today, we have crossed six of the nine planetary boundaries. Once we cross more, we will go into this strange world that we don't know how it will evolve and could become exponential. And that's what we need to avoid, and that's why the importance of the 1.5. Now, the agri-food systems, of course, includes social impacts, economic impacts, and also environmental impacts. And we need to look at it holistically, and we need to look at investments that are across the whole system, and not just investments in specific crops and, and commodities. But we also need to understand the synergies and the trade-offs, and that's extremely important. This year, FAO will be launching uh, the first SOFA of a series of two 
of the true cost of food, true cost accounting, where basically we're going to measure all those externalities that are being affected to the environment, to the socioeconomy, as a result of, of production of the agri-food systems. And I think that will be important, not because we want prices to increase, but better because we will have a better guideline of where to, for example, make proper incentive, how to, for example, repurpose support to agriculture so that it reflects those externalities. Now, it's important to understand that the agri-food system is there to provide food. It's the one that will provide the right to food, will help us to have all the food that we need to eat. But at the same time, to be able to do that, this agri-food system has some externalities. In climate change, it creates between 30 to 31 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions. In biodiversity, 80 percent of threatened terrestrial species are endangered due to land use change driven by agriculture. Water scarcity will be a challenge, and 70 percent of the fresh water withdrawals is used by agriculture. And pollution, 80 percent of marine pollution comes from the land. So we need to understand those externalities, but not in the negative sense. It's something that agriculture needs to be able to achieve that. That's the set of these parables today. What we need to do is how we can invest and attract climate investment to the agricultural sector that will reduce those externalities so that we can be better in the future. And that's our motto, which is better food for today, so good food for today and for tomorrow. And that's what links the today, which is the immediate need to achieve and reduce the 735 million people in chronic undernourishment, but also assure that they have the right to food tomorrow. And if we don't take care of those externalities, we are not going to resolve the problem for tomorrow. That's why it's so important to have these intertemporal linkages between good food for today and good food for tomorrow. <laughs> so the greenhouse gas emissions from the agri-food systems are important, as I mentioned before, and they come from different sources. And we have been doing significant work to try to decompose where these resources come from. And this is extremely important because it allows us to understand where we can work on carbon neutralization. In red, you have the mitigation potential through extension through emission reductions expressed as percentage of annual emissions of agri-food systems. And in green, you have the sequestration potential through carbon capture in ecosystems expressed as percentage of annual emissions of the agri-food systems. As you can see, the mitigation potential is significantly big in reduction of food loss and waste in livestock, in manure management, in fertilizers, in rice, and in land use uh, of forests and peatlands. But also we have significant potential of sequestration in soil management and also, of course, in land use. So those activities are the ones that will allow us to achieve this reduction of externalities. And that's where our investors investment needs to focus, how we can improve efficiency on those sectors through improved governance, improved productivity, improved production practices, improve consumption patterns and behavior, and use of clean, cleaner energy. That's what will allow us to achieve the goal that we are trying to achieve in this process. Now, what is the strategy and how we plan to implement this and what is the goal of FAO behind this implementation? Our idea is to bring the whole system operation, and this is the strategic framework of FAO. And we have focused our whole strategic framework based on four elements which are central. Better production, because we need to produce more with less. We need to be efficient and we need to increase productivity, trying to capture and benefit in all our practice in the reduction of these greenhouse gas emissions, as I mentioned before. Second, we need to put good food, quality food. That's why I said good food for today and good food for tomorrow. And that's the nutrition part, how we can accelerate the improvement of the quality of the food we eat and reduce the number of people that don't have access to healthy diets. Third, we need better environment. And that's linked again to mitigation and adaptation practices and better use of land and water. So how we can achieve better production, better quality of food through better nutrition, and at the same time, improve our environment. Because we need to understand the agriculture, the agri-food systems will be the one that will be the most affected by the climate and by the deterioration of the environment. If we are not careful, we will be affected as the agricultural system, the agri-food system. That's why, again, let me repeat again, better food, good food for today and good food for tomorrow. If we don't comply with better environment, we won't have the good food for tomorrow. And we, at the same time, will be violating the right to food of people. So it's not only assuring right to food today, it's assuring right to food tomorrow. And that's why environmental is so heavy. And if we are able to comply those, and we are able to dip into the most vulnerable people so that we assure inclusion, 
then we will get the better life. And that's where our social protection programs, our resilience programs, our emergency programs are to assure that we are inclusive. But all of this will require, require significant accelerators. And FAO is trying to invest enormously on this, on data, improving our data and accelerating the quality of our data. We want to have farmers and small farmers that can do precision farming because those are the ones that really need to use the resources efficiently because they have significant budget constraints. We also need technology and innovation. Science and technology will be central. That's why FAO created the post of the chief scientist, because we want to bring back the strength of science into the agri-food systems. We need to look at solutions. All the risks and uncertainties that we'll be facing require scientific solutions to make our system more resilient. We need varieties which are more resilient to drought, to excess of water. We need varieties that can produce more using less inputs. We need varieties that, that can create the supply that we need at the standards and the quality we need. And that's where science and innovation will play a significant role. But finally, we have the complements. Because to be able to achieve that, we need good governance. We need human capital trained, prepared for that. We see in Africa the amount of youth people that needs to get involved again into the agri-food system. We need to have institutions in place that will allow us to do that so that we can move forward. Any change in technology and innovation will require these complements. We cannot just transfer the technology. We need to bring the complements with the technology. If not, it will not be inclusive. It will basically increase inequalities and benefit a group and not the other. And that's what we need to, to avoid. We have developed a structure that brings all our programmatic activities towards these four betters and taking into account our accelerators. Our job today as FAO is to de-risk private sector investment through information. Our technical work is oriented towards de-risking by providing information on what we need to do trying to bring as much support to governments to be able to reduce the risk that any IFI or World Bank or a private sector will have when we try to do investments. One of our major means of implementation is the Hand in Hand Initiative. The Hand in Hand Initiative is a country-led, country-driven initiative that today covers 67 countries, the most vulnerable countries. And what we do there is exactly this. We bring the four betters into action through territorial approaches using geospatial information and quality information that allow us to target investments in the areas where agriculture can create the income that these households need. So today they are poor, but they have the potential to do it. But there are bottlenecks that doesn't allow them to unleash that potential. We go there and build investment plans to reduce those bottlenecks and unleash that potential. And that we believe with those investment plans will help the private sector to target their interventions and to de-risk themselves through the MDBs through places like MIGA that give guarantees to operate in countries which are risky, through other mechanisms that will allow to accelerate the investment that we want to accelerate. Colleagues, let me finish by saying that COVID-19 and the pandemic sends a wake-up call of the fragilities of food security, but also provide us the opportunity to reevaluate how we tackle the root causes of hunger and build resilience against threat to build back better. Clearly, there is an investment gap but we need to use the resources we have in the best possible way. Today, there is investment required from the governments, and one option, one window, is this agenda of repurposing of support to agriculture. There is also resources from the IFIs and from the ODA, the multilateral development banks, that we need also to better coordinate to target these investments. There is the resources that come uh, from the private sector that they will require support. And our idea is that we can de-risk through information and technical assistance. Of course, other financial institutions can support and de-risk in other ways. And finally, we have the foundations, the non-profit foundations. And they also can be catalytic. Their investments are smaller, but they can be catalytic and accelerate the process of what we are doing. Thank you so much and a real pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much, Maximo. We are really grateful. Uh, for your excellent points, very good perspectives uh, of the work that FAO is doing, but not very good numbers that we see on screen. Uh, <clears throat> that's an unfortunate reality. Now, in order to put these things in context, because we are focusing on the inclusive uh, aspect of the agri-food systems transformation or inclusivity, you mentioned good food for today and good food for tomorrow. I think we have to start with food for today and food for tomorrow for the marginalized communities and you know the people who are vulnerable uh, you also mentioned about the healthy diets but if we evaluate the cost of healthy diets which is around 
three dollars per person per day at the global level. Um, where do we stand? So in order to put every, I mean, these things in uh, uh, in in this bridge or the tunnel of the inclusivity or the inclusivity perspective, we have with us uh, Mr. Benjamin Davis, who, as I said, is the director of the. Uh, Rural Transformation and the Gender Equality Division uh, of the FAO. So could we request uh, Mr. Benjamin Davis to share uh, with us some of your, let's say, scene setting or keynote points taking on from the strategic perspective that Maximo presented, and then we go on to the panel discussion. So may I request, uh, Ben, uh, it's over to you, the virtual floor. Great. No, thank you very much, and good morning uh, to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Let me just go into a bit of detail following on what Maximo um, presented. Um, I think it's important to realize that agri-food systems reflect the, the discrimination, the exclusion, the inequalities, the power imbalances, and the vulnerabilities of our time more broadly, uh, leaving many people behind. Um, and again, paradoxically, those who are left behind within agri-food systems are those who most contribute to it, um, such as small-scale producers, agricultural workers, women, youth, and, and indigenous peoples. Um, they spend much, if not most, of their time and resources on farm, uh, yet they're the most likely to be food secure and live with precarious and uh, poorly remunerated jobs uh, in the informal rural economy. As Maximo mentioned, um, eight out of 10 of the working poor globally live in rural areas um, and in order to leave no one behind, investing in the transformation of agri-food systems means investing in soci socioeconomic inclusion, as we're discussing today, and investing in, uh, in creating abilities for those um, excluded so that they can participate fully in, in agri-food system transformation and contribute in a way which is meaningful to them. Let me just <laughs> give a few examples. Um, of uh, the kind of investments that could have a around inclusion that could have a transformative impact. I think one of the most important is regarding the use of investing in women who play key roles in agri-food systems as consumers, workers, uh, producers, entrepreneurs, and, and managers. Their roles, however, tend to be marginalized and their working conditions are likely to be worse than men's. This is all coming out of a, a, a global report that we prepared earlier this year on the status of, of women in agri-food systems. Uh, their roles tend to be irregular, informal, part-time, low-skilled, labor-intensive, and more vulnerable. Uh, women's access to land, input services, uh, finance, and digital technology, all of which are to uh, agri-food systems, continues to lag behind men, uh, men both in agricultural and food production. And this is globally in every region of, of the world. Uh, social norms often constrain women from producing crops and participating in activities dominated by men. And the gender gap in land productivity between female and male managed farms of the same size is 24%. Uh, on average, women earn 18% less than men in wage employment and agriculture. This means that women earn 82 cents for every dollar earned by men. Okay, so it's it's systematic across the 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 really every dimension of the agri-food system, uh, the marginalization of women, investment in women could really <clears throat> potentialize. Uh, the impact of this marginalization is marginalization is that globally in 2021, 31.9% uh, of women were moderately or severely food insecure compared with 27% of, of men. Um, closing the gender gap in farm productivity and the wage gap in agri-food system employment would increase global a gross domestic product by 1% or nearly 1 trillion uh, US dollars. The reduce global two percentage points, reducing the number of food insecure people by 5 million. If half of small scale producers benefited from development interventions focusing on empowering them, the incomes of an additional 58 million people would raise, increasing the resilience of an additional 235 million people. So showing the potential that could be that could be brought by explicit focus on, on the empowerment of wood within our development uh, interventions and investments. Another important example is youth. Again, the world's population is young, uh, about 1.2 billion youth uh, aged 15 to 24, uh, almost 88 uh, percent coming from developing countries. And employment opportunities for rural youth, particularly in, in, in at least in, in lower income developed countries, uh, remain limited and of poor quality. Um, almost 60% of child labor, that's about 100 million boys and girls, occurs in agriculture, 
which perpetuates um, rural poverty. But when children are forced to work long hours, their opportunities to attend school and develop their skills is limited, uh, which interfere with their ability to assess decent and productive employment opportunities later in life. Migrants and refugees are also often exposed to decent work and exploitation as, as agricultural workers. So if we're, if we're going to live up to the call to leave no one behind uh, and reach the, the 2030 agenda, um, it's also important uh, uh, to have clarity on who is exactly being left behind and why. Uh, Maximo talked about data. It's important that this data collection and disaggregation be disaggregated beyond gender and geography and age to include all the dimensions of intersectionality, including socioeconomic class and ethnicity, uh, and all forms of discrimination prohibited under, under international law. Um, it's also very important to incorporate small uh, rural producers into the scientific analysis and the food system model analysis being used to inform transformative policies and actions uh, to build sustainable livelihoods. Um, and it's fundamental that the mitigation policies alluded to by Maximo not be paid for by the poor in terms of foregone inclusion, foregone development and sustainable livelihoods over time and by, by the developed countries. And so engaging in multi-stakeholder, multi-sector and multi-liver policy analysis and formulation is essential to building this more holistic and comprehensive and impactful, uh, impactful investments. Just one final word about uh, additional word about FAO, let's say, uh, the work in on inclusive rural transformation in the Near East and the Africa region um, has shown the need for um, targeted investment addressing rural infrastructure, uh, institutions, uh, small and medium uh, uh, enterprises in the agri-food sector, rural advisory services, innovation, connectivity, uh, social protection, and, and the cooperative movement. Coordinated actions, partnerships, and commitments from, from different stakeholders are, are fundamental to creating uh, a, a better environment for financial inclusion of women and youth-led startups, uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, producer organizations, uh, cooperatives, and small-scale farmers. And one example is the uh, collective work being carried out by Arab Forum uh, uh, for Rural Advisory Services, which is merging um, regional network supported by FEO to foster knowledge exchange, networking, and policy advocacy for effective and inclusive rural advisory um, service systems. So again, I'm looking very much forward to the discussion today to get more into detail again about uh, investing for inclusion in agri-food systems, because uh, I think it's I think it's central if we if we hope to reduce the the inequalities um, that exist within the agri food systems today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. And uh, I believe you would stay with us uh, to share some of the closing remarks. Okay, let's uh, thank you so much for uh, giving uh, even more numbers. Uh, I didn't want to say yet again not very good numbers, but unfortunately that's the reality. But very good perspectives and particularly what we as FAO are doing and the other uh, partners, and most importantly, what needs to be done. So let's learn another, um, let's say, lesson or, or a practice that EFAD, our partner agency, the International Fund for Agriculture Development is doing. As you know, they invest in the food systems, and we have the director of food systems, Nadine Gabusa, with us. So, Madam Nadeen, if you can um, share with us what type of investments in your perspective have proven to be most successful First, in catalyzing or synergizing the smallholders' own investments, because we have been hearing and we heard now as well that they are the biggest investors in the uh, food systems transformation. But uh, if you can also kindly share that what type of investments or investment pathways would be more useful for the marginalized communities, let's say, or let's say women in particular. Um, so in your experience, in your portfolio, what are the lessons that we can learn and we can apply for our future interventions? Over to you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I think um, you started uh, when you, you, you opened the session talking about commercial agriculture and inclusive agriculture and that commercial is okay, but it has to be inclusive. And what we have learned in IFAD is that the two concepts are complementary. We want commercial inclusive agriculture, which means that for the smallholders, we are talking of basically profitable agri-food systems, not subsistence agri-food systems. And um, 
to be very concrete, I'll also try to give you some more positive figures, which shows that there's hope. And allow me to take the perspective of, of the Africa region, which um, I know the best. Let's first start by saying that the agri-food uh, system is worth 11 trillion a year in the world. It's one of the biggest industry, it's the biggest employment in, uh, sector in the, uh, in the world because you have billions of people to feed every year. So it's a big business and I think just last year the, the profits from the, the agri-food industry was 1.5 trillion. So the issue is how do you make this big business, which is a commercial business, also profitable for the smallholders and be inclusive so they generate some profit uh, from um, this big industry. And I want to take the African perspective. We have 1.4 billion on the continent today, which could be about 2 billion people. Yes, the figures are not very good, that about 20% of the people is, uh, is still going hungry today. But what w the other way to look at it is the potential. Basically, the opportunities, we know that, I mean, I take a country like Nigeria, you have 200 million people there. It's one of the biggest market and largest population in Africa. And you have 50% of the population, 100 million, working as smallholders. The majority of them living in poverty. Yes, it's the biggest African country to feed. So how do you make sure that they benefit from that? And I think uh, when you say, what does it take in order for, for them to be able to invest. The number one is that they need to access finance because you need finance to improve the value of your business. You need also to invest in order to generate more value. But the biggest thing, it's going back to the commercial. They need a market. They need to be able to access the market. And to give you a very practical experience, um, there's money there. You see the big agribusiness. I think you know Olam, you know Dan Gote in the region, or you know like Equity Bank, a financial institution. They make billions every year in the agri-food system business. You also those have those who import foods because there's not enough on the continent. And Africa imports $76 billion of food every, uh, every year. So this is a missed opportunities for the smallholders. They could produce this food. In terms of agribusinesses, they can also get engaged into producing and supplying this food that is going to be transformed. The kind of investment we've made, keeping with the example of Nigeria, is to say, you work with the government which says, I want inclusiveness. I want this business to go to the smallholders, not only the big commercial firms. How do we create this link, this partnership? And we had a, a firm like Olam in Nigeria, which set up factories there to process the food and supply this huge market of 200 uh, million people. So what do we do with the government is to say, they want the smallholders to supply these agro-processing firms so that they can sell and they can make money and you give opportunity to these big firms who have to transform, but they buy from the smallholders. So it's basically creating this link and they come and say we want to buy and we work with the, sm uh, the smallholders to say there's a market there and they get very excited. And the conversation is what do you need in order to supply the factories and the local ones or the big ones? And then we discuss it's farming, uh, practices improvements, it's improved inputs, it's working with the local government to invest in irrigation facility, rural roads or storage facilities, and then they commit. And they deliver, um, if I can say, tons of, for example, in this case, rice, they are able to deliver it to the suppliers. And you have a win-win situation where you bring Basically, the farmers, they commit, they say this is what we need to produce, access to finance, access to inputs, um, access to irrigation facility that they put together. And basically, the local government helps to put that in place with the development partners and the big firms um, commit to buy. And then you have a win-win situation that basically the food supply is guaranteed. You still need the big commercial farmers, but the wealth creation also reached the smallholders. And we were discussing that there's a whole technology and innovation angle that we are trying to add. Let me just finish to say that when we started this, uh, we were targeting, if I can say, the regular farmers. But when we talk about um, uh, attracting the youth and the women in agriculture, I can tell you that about 50% of those who were producing were youth because they saw money. 
and they were basically making in local currency millions of naira because they were selling and they were so excited and we call it the golden youth now engaging into agriculture because they are really making money and it's not subsistence agriculture like their parents were doing so this is the type of win-win investment that we need so that from these huge agri-food business opportunities they become inclusive and they bring along the smallholders but in a commercial perspective, not in a subsistence one. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think <clears throat> we need a paradigm shift. I personally do not like the subsistence farmers as the term. They are equal business units. They just have less endowments. And if we change and we reset this agri-food systems or food systems in a fashion where we take them at par with the big firms and make a business case you know, for them as well, rather than supporting them or subsidizing, I think we might have uh, different. And you, you already gave uh, different results, and you gave the example of Nigeria, which is a, quite a successful one. On financing, completely agreed. And uh, actually, that is our focus in FAO for this year in probably our uh, flagship publications as well. And as Maximo mentioned, we have uh, done a lot of work uh, on repurposing this whole support of hundreds of billions of dollars, or probably even more than a trillion, in order to channelize that. And that is also one of the core uh, outcomes that we could probably get out of this forum. So let's move to the other part that you mentioned, enabling them with, with the required things. And I think nowadays the most important is technology, enabling them with the technologies that otherwise they either not available or not accessible, that means affordable. And we have a good example with us uh, from a digital data network from Pakistan. Mr. Fouad Bajwa is with us. So Fouad, if you can share with us what are the experiences that you had you know, through this network, through enabling these smallholder farmers, or let's say marginalized farmers, and what was, let's say, the impact that it generated, and what are the lessons learned? Or let's say, if one has to understand what is the business case or the investment case to invest into these uh, so-called, uh, again, you know, smallholder farmers, let's say that's the term that we have to use, unfortunately. What is the investment case? Why governments or the public uh, or private sector investments should go into that? What are the results that you saw? Over to you. Thank you, Ahmed, and um, thank you, Fao, for having me. Um, when we started off four years ago, we established Agriculture Republic, a community before an initiative in order to understand the challenges in agriculture and food security in Pakistan with a focus on climate change. And when we, it's a 250 member organization today, it's a multi-stakeholder organization, and it has members from government, private sector, academia, civil society, and so forth. So through our 13 national consultations, we identified key areas or gaps which needed government intervention, private sector partnership, and involvement of the citizenry to sustain and ensure that the food supply in Pakistan amid COVID or any other crisis for that matter is, is, is we are able to sustain our food supply. And when we looked at that, the very people, the small holding farmers were disconnected from the urban system, agri-food system. They were only accessing the markets through the middlemen, and if anything happened to them, or if the middlemen was affected, the whole agriculture, uh, agri-food system value chain would be disconnected. And this is uh, highly disaster prone when we talk about climate. As our colleague from FAO was sharing, that apart from the unit economics, they are directly vulnerable, especially women and youth, to climate uh, challenges and climate change, which has been seen last year in Pakistan because of the great floods. So one thing was very clear that the small holding farmer community had to be connected, but at what cost? And in a world today which is defined by technology and where all markets have an online component connected with the offline component, how do these people interact with those when they don't have the financial power to buy technology just like the corporate farmers and the large scale farmers? So that is where Agriculture Republic proposed the Digital Dera Climate Resilient Smart Villages Network, which would 
lay down the infrastructure free of cost to small holding farmers in south of Punjab and would be rep replicated across Pakistan through a network called the Digital Dera Smart Village Network. So we started two years ago with the launch of the network in Park Patan in South Punjab uh, in a village called Chuck 26 SP. We created a company which is half owned by farmers and the intention of the company is to take farmer community centers, convert them, renovate them and convert them into a digital agriculture center and a farmer learning center. And with that, automate the overall irrigation system as well as take it on to precision agriculture and satellite supported machine learning and AI to predict yields. So at the moment, we have successfully developed a co cooperative as a company which brings internet from the city, high-speed internet, to these communities. And using digital agriculture, we've actually improved their produce. So now we have a case whereby we've developed a public-private partnership locally and globally, which funds the infrastructure. We sustain and uh, increase the infrastructure through contract farming, bringing in the large processors and food producers they forward by the crop, and they, uh, they invest in all the farming inputs. So now we've started a digital financial service, which is going to give loans to the farmers, the small holding farmers, and it is coupled with uh, parametric-based, index-based crop insurance to protect the whole cropping cycle. So this model at the moment is being promoted by the government of Pakistan. It has been suggested as part of the national policies. And the Asian Development Bank last year published uh, a strategy for the Central Asian Regional Economic Cooperation countries, suggesting digital data to be the agricultural innovation model for the Central Asian countries. So the co core component at the, or the co at the base of this model is youth and women. So in mornings, women, or women farmers utilize the digital data. In the afternoons, you have the youth uh, uh, taking benefit from it. And every day, you have farmer meetings who get direct information from this center. And uh, the biggest benefit is that we use technologies from Pakistani agri-tech startups. So we are helping local startups utilize their innovations at scale. So it is a very localized, very small holding farmer centric model which addresses climate challenges through resilience and adaptation through local solutions. Thank you so much for that. I believe that, of course, you would agree that this would be scalable, sustainable, and investable, correct? I hope that you know others agree. Of course, I mean, you are the. Well, uh, um, at, the, at the core is partnership, that it's everyone's responsibility to secure their agri-food system. Secondly, the involvement of the stakeholders, despite the fact that we are extending the technology free of cost, but it is helping them improve their livelihoods, okay. them access better wage prices for their crops, and have sustainable, uh, the sustainable support from the industry in the system today we operate all our uh, farming uh, at digital data is regenerative sustainable farming so we've got the industry to think about the future of these people and th the income from this model which is uh, we take 20 percent of the profits from the industry for the crops we grow for them now that money is going to help in um, covering the open sanitation reducing polio helping these, uh, these villages uh, uh, become, uh, we're adding concrete to it, but for the well-being of the farming community. The internet has brought you know, interest for the local youth to take a keen mm. interest in getting involved in farming. Before, mm -hmm. agriculture was becoming disinteresting for them. Why? Te technologically unsavvy, highly disorganized sector, and it requires a lot of innovation 
to bring it out from the tractor age into the AI age. Thanks, Rod. We'll come back on this one. I'm sure that on your digital data, as the Facebook is blocked on the computers for youth, otherwise it won't be productive. Okay, you mentioned the climate change and sustainability, and let's move to that one. We have with us uh, Madam Shada Sharif, who's uh, working <coughs> with the, let's say, smallholders, uh, but particularly from a resilience and climate change and sustainability perspective. She's uh, managing the Sustain MENA initiative. So, Shada, a question to you is that, I mean, you're doing fantastic in terms of the sustainability because one of our core areas is also a better environment. You know, you heard four batters from Maximo in the beginning, and of course, it is not just our plan of action or work, it's everyone's business nowadays, a sustainability. But sustainability, as uh, Nadine mentioned, at what cost? So, in your, let's say, experience, particularly in, in our region, do you really have, uh, for example, the enabling environment, particularly the access to finance for the green enterprises, which are essentially small or women-owned enterprises, because oftentimes in our existing rigid financial systems, there may not be much of a margin, particularly to, to have the enterprises or the initiatives uh, financed, which are towards the sustainability that essentially in a way, I mean, I'm, I'm use, uh, taking a liberty of being a moderator, may not be, let's say, economically efficient or let's say a business case for the financial institutions. So what is your take on that and what can we particularly do in order to invest into enabling that uh, financing, which was mentioned, by the way, uh, by many speakers since morning. So Shada, I hope you're with us, if you can kindly uh, re respond to this one by sharing your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much to FAO for organizing uh, this event on such an important topic today. I hope the sound is clear. Good morning to you all from Amman, Jordan. Um, I think before we begin on answering the question of finance, it's important to, to define what green enterprises are. Uh, and I, I believe for sure that they have a broad range of financing solutions, but it's, sometimes it's an issue of really uh, ensuring we have clear framing uh, of, what, of what constitutes a green enterprise. And so that term encompasses today both the environmental and social objectives of that enterprise alongside of course the economic benefit that it hopes to create um, and this can mean and it can apply to enterprises in any sector of the economy um, you know obviously green for for a time has been uh, mistakenly associated primarily with the um, energy sector but of course uh, today we're focusing on agri-food that certainly falls within the green definition uh, but also sectors like uh, water quality and efficiency, waste management, ecotourism, climate smart agriculture, agriculture uh, clean transport, uh, enterprises or even enterprises that support these sectors that are not directly working in uh, sectors we perceive as green but are supporting these great enterprises, such as those in finance, ICT, education, and communication. And we see these enterprises popping up both within a rural and an urban uh, context. Uh, and so it's very important to, once we define what constitutes a green enterprise, is to understand that it really encompasses a broad range of people. And the inclusivity aspect here then becomes very important because uh, certainly many leading these kind of enterprises are women, are youth, are refugees. Um, so what's important to en enable financing for these types of enterprises is first the presence of a favorable policy framework. Um, so this can include aspects of a national vision, for example, Jordan's recent economic modernization vision or Saudi's vision 2030 have a very strong articulation of the need to enable a green economy and, and green growth. Uh, what follows after that is regulations, uh, you know, for those enterprises that want to operate in waste, in, in uh, you know, smart agriculture, in, in uh, renewable energy, and then strategies and targets such that when these companies are, are trying to operate within this framework, they're able to see how they are contributing to a broader national objective uh, and by extension to uh, broader uh, global objectives. Um, so climate action has been uh, one of the key drivers actually to mobilize green and climate finance for countries in the region, both from an adaptation and mitigation uh, perspective. Uh, the World Bank has recently issued a number of country climate and development reports, which really show how climate action can help development goals and aspirations of a country 
uh, and thereby unlocking investments and jobs. Uh, so it's very important to try and make that linkage between climate and development in countries of the region in order to uh, direct the benefit of climate finance towards development objectives and towards really helping the most vulnerable in, in, a, in a society. Uh, and so enterprises, you know, their capacity can be built to align their offerings, their projects within these frameworks and facilitate their access to these funds, be it, you know, the Global Environment Facilities Small Grants Program or for larger enterprises that can benefit from bigger ticket uh, sizes through the GCF or the Adaptation Fund. Um, building on that, you know, enterprises definitely can engage with government-led pro projects in the form of public-private partnerships. These can range from small scale at the municipal level uh, to obviously larger projects um, or take part in investment uh, opportunities. These, once they are termed as green, they would be backed by concessional finance or guarantees uh, or uh, impact uh, investors. Uh, another interesting trend we're seeing is uh, a trend towards green public procurement. And this is directly uh, targeting uh, the you know, uh, engagement of medium and small sized enterprises or even micro enterprises in a country. Uh, and so this is how the public sector really can also bring in uh, the uh, smaller enterprises into uh, development. Of course, when we talk about um, finance, it's important to keep in mind another demographic which we see popping up in Jordan and the region are startups. Uh, and there's a really a large scale, a large array of um, organizations supporting green startups from seed stage to ideation to growth. Uh, we see them all over the region operating. We're going to be hearing maybe shortly from our colleague uh, at Peritech, which is a great example, but I see many of these types of organizations in Jordan, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Morocco. Uh, and support can either be financial or in-kind support with a focus on capacity building. Uh, and once these enterprises, these women youth-led enterprises engage with e these ecosystem support programs, they are then in a position to attract impact investors. Uh, and so if we focus on this potential here, the region can really emerge as a regional hub for that type of social and environmental impact uh, driven investment. The banking sector has an important role to play uh, in the green finance landscape, of course, and they're driven by their other uh, kind of trends in this area. The, global ESG frameworks are, are more and more pulling banks, banks into that direction. Uh, and so we see banks like, for example, Jordan's Kuwait Bank issuing its first green bond, uh, which was earlier this year with support from the IFC. Also, we're seeing specialized credit lines popping up to in incentivize the adoption of green solutions. Uh, for example, uh, you might have heard of the green economy financing facilities that are a blended finance spot supported by the EBRD, the Green Climate Fund, the EU, and is operational now in, in countries like Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Morocco, uh, and has basically is based on partnerships with local financial institutions. In Jordan, that includes the Micro Fund for Women. And what, what is very interesting about these types of frameworks is that it has a pre-approved list of green technology solutions, not just what we typically think of green. It, it extends into agriculture, into waste, uh, and solutions that are very useful, uh, maybe in more rural contexts uh, as well. In the spirit of inclusivity that we're talking about today, uh, of course, you know, financing could also take the form of very directed specialized programs. I was part of a project uh, led by ESQUA uh, called the Regent Project, which really looked at how uh, small scale renewable energy technology can strengthen women's economic empowerment in rural areas in Jordan uh, and Lebanon. Uh, and so, you know, these kinds of very specific uh, programs can also give directed uh, support to that demographic. And that program was really based on collaboration with community-based organizations and micro funds for women. My final point really is, is that, you know, what we've seen unfolding in the region over the past weeks, um, you know, we've, in the context of, of wars and power imbalances, of course, this can severely uh, put a you know, uh, a wrench in all of our discussions on food security and overall safety of already vulnerable populations comprised primarily of women, refugees, the elderly and people with disabilities. And so, of course, peace and access to and the ability to control a country's own resources is certainly the first prerequisite, prerequisite to achieving inclusivity in agri-food and, of course, then paving the way uh, for what we talked about in terms of enabling access to finance. Thank you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Shada. I wish you could have been uh, with us in person, but um, there are certain realities that we have to be mindful of. Thank you so much. I think you mentioned uh, 
I would rather say a positive picture, which is very encouraging. And of course, uh, um, the, the critics of uh, this type of schemes would say that we are look, having more and more of green washing. I have a new term to introduce, green harvesting, because it will be much more in agriculture now for the next 10 to 15 years. And we have a good example of, uh, let's say, criticizing on my terminology, the berry tech. Nicholas, berry tech is, you know, let's say, if I can call it as a platform. I mean, please don't mind if you don't call it as a platform, but an ignorant like me. But you basically support the startups through, you know, tech, tech oriented startups in the food security uh, and agriculture landscape. But you also uh, essentially focus on the sustainability and, you know, all of these things. So if you can kindly share with us, first, what type of financing solutions in particular, because you would be supporting them through different financing vehicles uh, by yourself or by the intermediaries or by other providers. Um, are better for, let's say, tech-oriented uh, smallholders or SMEs in agri and uh, food security space? And secondly, how do you basically assess their so-called social and sustainability impacts? Because that's a bit challenging uh, topic, isn't it, when it comes to, and uh, as Nadine was mentioning in the beginning, I mean, we do have when these are at scale or, let's say, the collective, but you would start with one or two, you know, um, uh, in, in terms of the smallholders, uh, sorry, uh, the small enterprises. So how do you manage these type of challenges and what are the lessons learned particularly because from a perspective of, let's say, invoking the attention of the potential investors, be it public or private sector, in supporting these type of enterprises? Over to you, Nicholas. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, first, let, let me uh, thank you for hosting us to be part of this event. I'm really humbled to be with esteemed panelists uh, today, so so Beritech, you know, it's a non-profit organization that has been working for the last 20, first 21 years in Lebanon, you know, to support innovation with a strong mission to create jobs, foster innovation and tech in Lebanon and in, in the region. So definitely we have our investment arm that includes some uh, uh, funds. We have established the first VC fund in the region 15 to 20 years ago, mainly focusing on tech. And later on, we shifted a bit and today, under the programmatic arm of the group, we focus a lot on agri-tech, clean-tech solution, among others. We definitely work with startups, idea stage organization, up to internationalization, but also we work a lot with medium to mature organization and SMEs who are the engine of all economies. So uh, the program that I currently lead on, which is a flagship program called Water and Energy for Food, or We for Food, it's a joint international initiative funded by six donor partners. It includes CEDA, NORAD, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, German BMZ, the EU, and USAID. The activities of the program are conducted in through five regional innovation hubs in the world, and the Middle East and North Africa hub is managed by Beritech and its consortium partner, who are locally rooted organizations working from the region for the region with boots on the ground in most of the countries we are covering, which stretch from Morocco up to Yemen. It includes Sudan, Egypt, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq. What is the aim of the program? The aim of the program is to enhance food security, optimize food system while using less water and energy. It has a lot, of it has as well a strong gender lens focus emphasize a lot on improving livelihood of vulnerable communities, including base of the pyramid, by mainly pushing for private sector engagement. We mainly work with those SMEs, medium to mature organizations, that have innovation that can address challenges of the water, energy, food nexus. But when I say innovation, we are talking about innovation related to tech, science, engineering, business model, and the intersection of those elements. We have those organizations scale. They should work with at least thousands of smallholder farmers and end users, helping them improve their crop yields, save less water, save, wo save uh, uh, energy, access to market, among others, and help them reach thousands and tens of thousands of end users. So how do we go about it? We provide them with catalytic grants up to $250,000 each. We provide them with a various range of technical assistance. We work with them on investment readiness and facilitation. We provide them with de-risking mechanisms. To date, we have supported more than 35 innovative companies in the region. In aggregate, they have reached more than 248,000 smallholder farmers and end users 
while saving more than 7.8 billion liters of water, increasing food production by 4.8 million tons, saving more than 900,000 tons of CO2 emission, and most importantly, they were able to leverage, uh, leverage our catalytic grants and raised more than $33 million of private debt or equity capital, and we have more than $10 million of transactions in the pipeline. However, when we say that we want to promote investment, promote innovative financing scheme, push for blended finance, among other, this comes with great responsibilities, is to make sure in the event there is a wide-scale adoption of a solution and technology that it does not affect negatively the environment, the climate, or biodiversity. This when comes our role, which starts from the selection process up to the end of the performance period, is to assess the environmental impact of those solutions. And we have noticed a lot of adverse impact from activities conducted on the ground when we go through site visits, meet with the smallholder farmers. And one of them, for instance, is solar PV pumping. All the smallholder farmers that we have interviewed have reported additional usage of water when they get access to those technologies. So where our role stand in this? On a social level, we make sure that the technologies or innovation we are supporting are accessible to those smallholder farmers and vulnerable communities. If they are digitally illiterate, are the companies making some arrangement to help them use those solutions to make it more user-friendly? Are they working on the access to finance component, be it via microcredit institution or adapt their financial model to allow them to benefit from this solution? Usually, highly uh, capital-intensive solutions are expensive and they cannot afford it up front. If not, are they planning to do some arrangement? Are they willing to work with some partners? To make a long story short, we have a very thorough selection process, and a lot of the companies that we are supporting wish at a certain point that they did not join the program because it's slow and painful in the beginning, but shortly after, they start grasping the benefit of it. Over and above, there is one thing that we have noticed in the MENA region, is that beside the fact that this water, water is scarce, a lot of the innovation that we are supporting with help those smallholder farmers increase their income, it allowed them to exploit additional farmlands. And given that this is a water stress region, it was flagged to us that some aquifers and water table in the areas where most smallholder farmers are scattered, scattered at, at risk. So today we are creating a dashboard that builds on uh, remote, water, remote sensing, water accounting plus, and waypoint data by FAO to assess the yearly variation of water table in some selected basins over the last 10 years, how it will look like in 5, 10, and 15 years by using worst-case scenario of climate change under IPCC, and what happens if there are some solution technologies or additional farmlands exploited around those aquifers that are risked. This dashboard should hopefully be a public tool to be used by everyone so it can inform investors or organizations that they are pushing for additional farmland exploitations to see if there are some risk around it or not. Over to you, Dr. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Uh, very interesting. Can we buy shares of Baritech? Looks very promising. No. Good. Um, great initiative. And of course, we have been you know, inviting you in different sessions to share some of the lessons and we partnered in some of the competitions as well. Okay. So we have focused quite a lot on the smallholders, but we, I mean, the big brothers are also important, or big brother is the most important. So one of the big brothers with us uh, from HSA, that is a company based in Yemen, but probably the largest, I think, agri-enterprise, agri-business enterprise in the Middle East. And we have uh, online with us Adib Qasim, who unfortunately could not join in person. Adib, if you can share with us, you know, some of the examples particularly not, not, let's say, the commercial side. We know that you're one of the most successful companies in the world as well. But how are you contributing towards the SDGs, particularly the SDGs on uh, two for sure, I mean, the zero hunger, but uh, the, the uh, let's say, women empowerment five and, you know, even SDG 12 or others, because I believe that you in particular uh, are focusing on the economic development initiatives. So how are the large players in the agri-business or agriculture are contributing towards enhancing the inclusivity 
in the agriculture and food systems. Over to you, Adib, and then uh, we would have, uh, we would like to include the audience as well. We will take a couple of questions, so kindly keep your questions ready. Over to you, Adib. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, having me with you today. I'd, I'd really like to thank FAO for the invite, and it's really great to see uh, the wide representation of stakeholders on, on, on the panel. And, and please allow me to start maybe a little bit by giving a bit of context uh, of, of uh, where our uh, focus today in terms of this intervention on Yemen, uh, and then maybe about the private sector role, and, and, and then dig a little bit deeper on HSA group and what it does and its contribution to the different SDGs. Um, uh, so as, as you might know, Yemen is um, unfortunately is facing one of the uh, largest uh, humanitarian um, challenges uh, and crisis uh, in the world. Over 50% of population uh, are considered uh, food insecure. Uh, th this food crisis is compounded by a very high dependence on imports, so 90% of food is being imported and a significant decrease in the purchasing power of, of people uh, due to the conflict, uh, as well as, and I think that's something that has been highlighted in this forum, is the long-term underinvestment in, in domestic uh, production. Uh, and then uh, along all that comes uh, a very important humanitarian aid operation that has been going on for eight years, but unfortunately it has its own set of limitations. So you have uh, uh, funding challenges, but you have also an ongoing humanitarian uh, operation that doesn't really uh, also work along the development side where, where, where the capacities of the local communities are being uh, developed so they can take care of their uh, uh, food needs down the line. So having said that, uh, Yemen private sector in general plays a very major role in the food security in Yemen. And I, I, I wouldn't be exaggerating if I said it have really helped uh, averting a major uh, and widespread uh, famine in, in the country. And that's because, first of all, it's, it's the main importer of food into the country. So about 75% of food is being imported by uh, private sector. But then also the, the local production that takes place in the country is mainly done by private sector players who are smallholder farmers who are really doing uh, all the food uh, and agricultural production in the country. Uh, private sector plays a major role in terms of getting the food into the country, but then also distributing it across the country through a very wide network of uh, uh, small and medium and micro enterprises, uh, tens of thousands of them that spread across the world. So very, very important to be resilient and flexible uh, to maintain a separation despite uh, conflict and shocks. Uh, and then the, the private sector in Yemen uh, works hands in hands with the humanitarian operation. Uh, so, uh, providing the humanitarian operations with its uh, needs and supplies, uh, as well as supporting it in terms of distributing food across the country. So, having said this context, HSA comes in as one of the major players in Yemen. Uh, so, it's a family-based business. Uh, it's one of the largest in, the, in Yemen and one, and one of the largest in the country, but I think in, in, in the region as well. Uh, so very deep uh, roots in the in Yemen and the community, but uh, a, a wide and global uh, reach. And I think like uh, many of the family businesses, based businesses in the region, uh, you wouldn't hear much about the uh, philanthropic work being done. And I think that's part of it is uh, maybe family values of not talking about the good things you do. Uh, but I think there is a lot of lessons learned uh, and knowledge to be shared by 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 engaging with the private sector in the region in general, and especially uh, family-based uh, businesses. Uh, so HSA approach in, in Yemen has, is two-pronged. You have the core operations, uh, and then you have the uh, philanthropic uh, arm. Uh, so for example, when it comes to SDG2 uh, and, and working to uh, uh, achieve the zero hunger uh, target, uh, HSA has to maintain a very responsive and resilient uh, food operation. It's a major importer of, of, of wheat into the country, and it's also a major uh, food producer and manufacturer in the country. Uh, and when you are in conflict, uh, the food you supply is really uh, key to people surviving. So you have to be really resilient. You have to figure out how you maintain your supply chains. Uh, and you have to do that in a way that ensures availability and affordability uh, so people can really uh, access it. So. 
uh, we, we work a lot with a lot of our partners. For example, we work with WFP uh, in supplying their operations and we also work with them in producing, for example, uh, high energy bars and date bars for the uh, school feeding programs. Uh, we also have a very strong uh, uh, foundation uh, that reach across the country uh, and, and has a major operation in terms of uh, food distribution, uh, working with uh, different communities, but also working on development kind of projects. So rehabilitation of roads or, for example, uh, rehabilitation and development of uh, water systems, irrigation systems. So that's when it comes to uh, SDG 2. Uh, another, I think, SDG that's relevant, maybe we can talk about is decent work. So uh, HSA, for example, is one of the largest employers in the country, over 20,000 employees. Uh, and, and one of the values, I think, of the company is, uh, despite the conflict, is how you make sure that you don't lay off uh, people and that how you can develop their skills uh, and make sure that you reskill them so they can meet uh, the new needs uh, uh, in the country. Uh, so you would see a very strong uh, learning and development program that far targets uh, internally, but also uh, is offered to the community. So uh, a lot of work and development of uh, technical vocational academy, uh, supporting and rebuilding and rehabilitation of schools in the country, uh, building a university, uh, or for example, working on a scholarship program that could uh, absorb uh, people. And uh, I think one more thing I want to talk about here, uh, just to highlight another example, is thinking about uh, and it's relevant to SDG 9 when we talk about industry and innovation uh, for an organization that's mainly industrial with uh, a lot of plants in the country in Yemen and spread uh, across the region, Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, there is a lot of focus that needs to be done, uh, uh, especially when you talk about vulnerable and marginalized communities, about uh, R&D and understanding the consumer behavior when you are under distress. Also, how you can improve your uh, uh, product so they meet the rigorous environment in terms of transportation and so forth. Uh, last, I want to highlight a new initiative that we are really working on, and we think it's very relevant to the discussion that's been going on. And what it is, we're thinking about of establishing a social innovation lab that's focused on agri-tech uh, and agricultural production. So uh, how we can, as a private sector, uh, take initiative and lead in terms of supporting local entrepreneurs, uh, supporting uh, innovators, uh, bringing in women uh, into and youth into this uh, into this uh, food system, uh, and how we can think of or what are the challenges when it comes, for example, to sustainability or inclusivity of of the food system, uh, and working, of course, with the other partners uh, uh, in the re in the system to achieve these objectives. Um, thank you, and over to you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Adeep. Uh, that's uh, good to hear about your social innovation lab and others. Um, uh, distinguished panelists and participants are now online. We were a bit late, but we'll try to take a liberty to extend it by five to 10 minutes and a particular request to Ben, if you can kindly extend for uh, five, 10 minutes, because we would request you to close uh, the session with your final thoughts. But now in order to be truly inclusive, may I request if there is any question from the audience and I think we have a question from Dr. So, Mariam, if you can please, and then we will have a rapid fire round to the panelists, and then we would conclude. There is no second round of questions, so please feel relaxed. Hello? Well, thank you, panelists. Well, I don't have a, a question, just a general comment, and maybe we'll receive not an answer, a response from one of you. Because yesterday and the day before yesterday and today we were talking about small farmers and many good things in the field of agriculture and about the women uh, roles. But so far I didn't hear anything regarding the land tenure system because it is one of the obstacles in many countries, especially in Africa, because according to my understanding, all the land belongs to the government. And because the small farmers, they have a small lots of land. And the problem when the woman manage those lands, 
they have difficulties in get it, uh, getting microcredits from the bank because the lands are not in their name or not under their supervision under the name of men in general speaking. So what is the future to solve the problem of the land tenure for the small farmers? I don't know if this is a question or a comment and you can answer, anyone can answer this one. And thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. This is not a question. This is excellent question. So thanks a lot for this. I think we should have covered this one. I believe that Ben, if I can request probably in your closing remarks, you can mention that and the VGTT work that we do in FAO. But I, I don't know if any of the panelists or Nadine, you would like to address that. Uh, because I believe that Ifado is also working on some of those aspects and from the panelists as well, but 30 seconds for the response, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to, to respond in 30 seconds. I think it's a long, long-standing issue, the land tenure rights. It's not only that um, the land belongs to the government, but it's, it also belongs to the community or community members who are not always farming the land. And so there's a whole issue of access of the youth, of the women, or what we call landless farmers, which is a bit of a contradiction, but it is those who don't have access to the land. And it's true that the reform of the land tenure rights, as the progress is slow, the issue is identified as critical. And I was talking to a young woman farmer from uh, Mozambique just last week, and she was telling me that she is into farming, uh, she has to rent the land, and as she's uh, making more money, then the owner of the land takes it the year after because he realized that it's a profitable business. The other issue, as you know, is that she cannot invest uh, in the land because it's not hers. The reform of the land tenure right has been kind of a standing issue for smallholders, which has not found uh, its political resolution because it's a very sensitive issue. In Africa, they say that there, there are two things for which people die, men die. It's women and land. Uh, so you can see that it's a very sensitive issue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nicholas, please. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a, a very sensitive question. Thank you for asking it. So just I'm trying to cover the access to finance uh, component. So just for you to know, taking into example Middle East and North Africa, as per the, what, what the World Economic Forum, the MENA region is the second widest region in terms of gender gap, and it will take more than 107 years to close this gap. So whatever intervention initiatives we are looking to do will be to make a breakthrough and try to put things on the right track. In terms of initiatives, we, for instance, under we for food are working with a microcredit institution in Lebanon called Al Majmua that's mainly focused on providing financial solution and microcredit to women working in the agri sector, given that it's the biggest employer in, uh, of women. In Egypt, less than 5% of women are the owners of the land. There is a national bank for Egypt with whom we got the chance to meet, to meet with the, the lady in charge two months ago. They are pre providing also credit for smallholder farmers that includes women with an approval process than less than three weeks. One of the way to bypass the land ownership is try to get a no objection letter or um, sort of a, a, a lease agreement from the owner. What I'm trying to say that there are initiatives, we are on the right track, it will take some time and hopefully we will be able to cover the gender gap in a, in a region where social, cultural and ethnic, ethnical challenges are prevailing. Thank you very much, Nicholas. We, we do need uh, to fast track that. Okay, now since we are uh, almost on time now, I mean, uh, the closing time, uh, but uh, listen, my job as a moderator does not end because the communication colleagues who are sitting here, they would ask me to write some tweets, and I'm a very lazy person. I actually, by misusing the moderator position, I'll pose that back to the panelists. So in closing remarks, if each one of you would have to tweet what practical actions do we need to take in order to 
invest in inclusive agri-food systems transformation. And tweet is, as you know, limited characters. Let's start with the online participants, and then we'll go to the floor. And then finally, we, we would request Ben to close uh, or give the closing remarks. So Shada, may I request uh, if you can give your tweet for that? Hi, Ahmed. Apologies, I lost your sound for a minute. Could you just kind of repeat uh, what yes, you'd like us to address? What we are requesting is that if we have to tweet, that means very limited words, what practical actions do we as the development community need to take in order to enhance the investments in inclusive agri-food systems transformation? Mm -hmm. What would you tweet? I would say uh, designing targeted uh, financing uh, programs aimed at empowering uh, women in rural areas in the MENA region. Excellent. You still had 70 characters, but that's your choice. Thank you so much, Shada. I know that you have to leave Thank you. early. Uh, but you, I mean, we would take max 10 minutes. So, Adib, over to you for the tweet. Okay, I, I would say it would be uh, leverage the strengths and expertise of local, uh, local uh, players uh, to in a partnership uh, model. Okay, you utilized even less, but that's your choice. So let's go to the panel uh, on ground. Uh, Fouad, what would you tweet for that? Invest in youth and women today, sustain the future. Well, you are even shorter, but more political. Okay, finally, uh, no, Nicholas, and then finally, Nathan. Nicholas, what would you tweet for that? I would tweet that uh, we should focus on promoting blended finance mechanisms that can be implemented by locally rooted partners. Okay, thank you. You are in the middle. Nadine, finally, and you have uh, not just tweet, but you have tweet plus because you are our partner agency before going to Ben. So you can have a tweet and closing remarks before we request Ben. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, Okay, so, so what I would say is that inclusive agri-food systems is about really um, giving the opportunity to the smallholders, to the youth, to the women, to capture some of the money that is going into that business. Please, let's not forget that it's a huge industry. It's making trillions of dollars every day. We talk about the African continent. It's 76 billion of imports. It's job, it's money, it's agribusiness companies. So let's give them an opportunity to make money out of it. And it's not lack of will, it's lack of means. It's lack of opportunities. And I think once we do that, we'll really have inclusive agri-food system business where also the smallholders, the youth and the, and the women can have their share of the profits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. We have got an idea for a joint paper with Ifad equity in the agriculture yields. <laughs> okay, thanks. So with that, uh, Ben, we get back to you with uh, your final concluding remarks. And if you can share with us what really needs to be done by the global community in order to ensure or enhance or attract the investments right. in inclusive agri-food systems. Over to you, Ben. Great, thanks. Um, well, first, just to say it's been a super interesting panel, I think, because as was mentioned, I mean, a broad variety of stakeholders from different perspectives, coming at the issue of inclusion from uh, a number of different dimensions and also represent different contexts, right? Particularly within the region, but also beyond. So I think it brought out uh, many of the, the key areas that need to be looked at when we talk about um, um, inclusion. I think some of the, let's say some of the lessons that I'm taking is that one is, uh, well, there's multiple models, let's say, to addressing many of the, the constraints that small scale producers and agents, let's say, within agri-food systems face in terms of being able to participate. There's multiple models in terms of trying to address these uh, um, uh, market failures and and, and barriers. Um, some of these models, and these models can come from different forces, let's say, within agri-food systems. So it's not only from the public sector or from IFIs or from development agencies, but very much from the private sector itself. And so, you know, we had the fascinating example of Yemen, where, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a large company, right, social conscience, let's say, um, which is addressing issues of inclusion across a number of dimensions. Um, 
to other examples where you have you know informal parts of the of the um, let's say the value chain, small and medium producers who also have formal ways of bringing in. Um, the, Nadine was talking about a lot of research in Nigeria on the, on the role that, let's say, small and medium <clears throat> businesses play in terms of informal relations with small-scale producers to bring them in uh, and uh, to the to the to participate in, into the value chain. And so I, I think that's an important lesson is that this can happen in many dimensions. However, it doesn't just happen by itself. It has to be explicit. It has to be um, targeted. Um, that the, the nature of the of capitalism and the market is towards inequality and concentration. So that's why it takes uh, concerted efforts in order to make the process inclusive um, and um, and participatory. And I think, the, again, these are all very good um, examples. But I very much uh, appreciated the comment from the audience because, again, it brought up the issue of many of kind of the fundamental constraints which are still present in many rural areas globally, right? I mean, fundamental basic ones just around land, as we heard, of course, even within land, the differentiation by different tensions of intersectionality, particularly gender, um, but obviously also, you know, class, economic class, socioeconomic class. And so uh, all the innovations are fundamental, but also have to be thinking about the basics as well um, and, um, and how to address those. And again, that's usually the role of the public sector is how to make sure that um, these, these issues, we can't, we can't forget about that. We can't just talk about innovation. We also have to talk about uh, the constraints that um, the small scale sector face. Um, I think also very important, particularly in this region, and I very much appreciate, uh, again, the deep discussion of, of the, in the context of conflict and instability. Again, um, I think Shada brought this up well, you know, there's a, you know, a catastrophe unfolding in the region, right, which, will lead to instability in agri-food systems in, in many dimensions, let's say, um, beyond the, the, the tragedy, let's say, of the catastrophe itself, um, following upon other, you know, major conflicts of the region in, in recent years. And so, it, I mean, and these, these political conflicts are increasing rather than decreasing, right? And they're becoming a more of a characteristic, let's say, of agri-food systems in the region. And so I think the... Uh, uh, it's an important element that can't be can't be um, forgotten in, in in the sense that it, you, you you need unless you know political resolutions are found right unless these bigger issues of peace and justice are addressed um, it's difficult again it just it makes it very difficult for inclusive process of transformation to happen right so you know we we can have a discussion here about all these technical issues if you don't resolve some of the basic political questions of peace and justice and self determination then it's uh, it, it's, it's quite difficult to move forward. And so I think from the perspective of international organizations, really our role is, I think when, if one is lacking, it's kind of this explicit recognition of these, what I will call informal forces within the agri-food system. They're not informal, they're very, they may be formal businesses, but they're not part of the public sector. I mean, they're part of the, the market, they're part of, you know, you know, the, it's not the magic hand of capitalism, but it's all these, uh, you know, these these uh, participants, let's say, in the food system who within their, you know, daily, you know, work basically uh, are probably the most important factor around inclusion inclusion in, in structural transformation. And the public sector and the IFI need to figure out how the best way to support this process, let's say, as really the, I mean, the, the driving force in, in agri-systems is private, whether you're a small scale producer or where, whether you're the value chain. And really our role is to how to facilitate the process and, and, and support these good practices that, that are emerging and, and see how we can incentivize them. So thanks. Thank you so much, Ben, an excellent summary. And I think we have some lessons and takeaways. So all uh, it is left now is to give a big hand to all of the panelists online and offline. Thank you so much, and we got some lessons learned from this one, which will go into our report and um, hopefully for some actions. So thank you so much uh, to all of the participants as well for your time. And now I think we would have probably one photo and then